Ladies and gentlemen, can we please take our seats? Nice, huh? Well, welcome to the F-Rock world. As you see, if you are 10 seconds late, the bell starts ringing. I worked together a number of years ago, ladies and gentlemen. In the F-Rock board between 14 and 21, I worked together with a very, very, very nice and witty and smart people on financial reporting. And even at that time, when somebody dared to be late, we had a vice chairman that then would get out his bell and literally started belling around the room to say we are going to start because we need to start now guess who this vice chair was it is a speaker that i may introduce this afternoon it is andreas barkov who is currently the isb chair and he's an experienced and highly regarded leader in the field of international accounting as you all know and he has started his term of the Chair of the International Accounting Standards Board in July 2021. It means he's not, it's not his birthday today, correct? <laughs> we had all kinds of birthdays, but it's not your birthday today. But we will move back into the world of financial reporting. And I will, and be careful, we at EFRAC take this also very seriously. It is true that in the market a lot is moving on sustainability reporting, but as some of my previous speakers already mentioned that does not mean that we are no longer working with the same speed professionalism and quality into financial reporting andreas the floor is yours best and thank you very much uh, for these kind words um <laughs> i was i was thinking you would probably divert a little bit and said um everybody now knows that i could really be a good bellman right <laughs> well always worth pursuing a second career. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's really a pleasure um, to be invited to speak at this um, momentous occasion celebrating two decades of IFRAC and its work uh, in financial reporting in Europe. IFRAC and I go back many years. Actually, Hans, you may know this, you may not this, know this, uh, we may have asked Ste starting with my contributing research on the distinction between liabilities and equity. So if anybody laughs in this room, that is really uh, something as an insight. If you don't, don't be bothered. To becoming a member of the AFRAX Technical Experts Group, and I have some of my previous members sitting here, uh, co-fellow members, and we had a very good time, I must say. Uh, where I witnessed the organizational changes brought about to EFRAC um, by the Maistat reform. And it was referenced this morning. I then switched roles and became an ex officio EFRAC board member um, because I had been appointed president of the German Standard Center. Finally, it was both a pleasure and an honor to have been asked to serve as EFRAC's vice president to chair the technical discussions and assist then President Jean Paul Gosses in his work. Unfortunately, he can't be with us. Uh, here today. When I decided to step down from uh, this position in early September 2020, it was surely with some regret um, because I truly enjoyed the role. And I hope that my fellow board members at that time, and many are in the room I know, um, feel the same. However, I had become aware 
that I was considered for the role I'm now in, and um, I took this decision in the best interest of both of our organizations and not to create any harm. I'm happy to see that our relationship uh, is still as strong as it used to be, and it was a fruitful one, and I'm pretty sure that it will continue to be that case during my tenure as ISB chair. Now, the ISB and EFRAC uh, certainly have a very special relationship, and that's on many accounts, and let me dwell on that a little bit. It spends many years of collaboration, discussion, and debate. We have always shared a common goal, and that was referenced today as well, regardless of our stances on various matters. And that goal is to create a global passport for uh, multinational companies in financial reporting, with EFRAC looking at the EU perspective and the IASB taking this on as the international standard setters. Maintaining a relationship of any kind that has lasted for more than two decades and indeed span the continent is no mean feat. We both share similar birthdays, Hans. Next year we will turn 25, actually 50 if you go back with the IASC, so mark your calendars. With the IFS Foundation being established and the ISB holding its inaugural meeting shortly before EFRA came into existence, it seems therefore fair to say that our history is intertwined. But moreover, it has been 21 years of shared success. In 2002, Europe adopted the IAS regulation requiring companies listed on uh, regulated securities markets, including banks and insurance companies, to prepare their consolidated financial statements in accordance with international accounting standards from 2005 onwards. And I think it is fair to say that Europe's decision to adopt IFRS accounting standards provided the necessary encouragement for most of the rest of the world to follow suit. Meanwhile, more than 140 jurisdictions have adopted the ISB standards around the globe. So arguably, our success is also Europe's success. Just look at how the quality and consistency of financial reporting worldwide has improved since then. EFRAC has been a constructive and positive influence on Europe in recognizing the merit of having a global reporting language and global reporting standards. The collaboration between our two organizations has led to real progress in ensuring that financial reporting is coherent to all investors and uh, wider stakeholders so they can make informed decisions. Over the many years, the IASB and EFRAC have collectively resolved reporting challenges. And even though at times EFRAC may bring different perspectives to the table than does the IASB, our discussions and debates have always been conducted with the aim of enhancing financial reporting by bringing transparency to those that rely on publicly available information for their decision making. As with any relationship, ours had challenges at times. We have not always agreed with each other. Sometimes that was because we followed different line of technical arguments. Sometimes that was the case because of our different mandates, with Europe and EFRAC serving the European public good and the ISB having to consider a global environment. However, these challenges do not undermine the long-standing and trusted relationship. We have no doubt that EFRAC's input is invaluable, not just in what we, the IFRS Foundation, and in particular the IASB do, but across all of Europe. And that was referenced again this morning. EFRAC ensures that the voices of those who do not necessarily have the means to contribute to our work can still be heard. EFRAC's ongoing contribution to our technical work is well informed and helps immensely in advancing our projects. And this is not lip service. EFRAC is a regular contributor, be it through informal exchanges, through comment letters, or by being on our accounting standards advisory forum that in fact will meet tomorrow and the day after. EFRAC is also of huge help in reaching out to different jurisdictions and stakeholders in Europe and organizing both targeted and general outreach activities, another déjà vu from the morning. And last but not least, its proactive work, also referenced this morning, and we didn't compare notes beforehand, stimulates the bake on topics for the ISB to consider working on. EFRAC's work, I'd say, um, let me start again. <laughs> it goes without saying um, that my time spent in different capacities at EFRAC and as the chair of the National Standards Center have given me insight into how I intend to orientate the role I now have as ISB chair. And why is that? Understanding the different mandates, needs, capacities, 
cultural backgrounds that exist around the world are an essential prerequisite for developing meaningful contributions to financial reporting globally. And you shouldn't underestimate how big the difference is from solving a technical issue from a conceptual point of view and winning the support of the jurisdictions on a global basis. That said, we must not forget that we all share a common goal and we are all working in the public interest. We therefore need to ensure that our local preferences do not stand in the way of achieving and maintaining a higher goal of a global reporting language. So looking to the future, what does all this mean? Well, I would say that the key priority for both the IESB and EFRAC is to balance the various needs of a wide range of stakeholders. We need to carefully choose areas to concentrate on and where it will really matter. We need to be mindful that every change means a cost to everyone in the financial reporting ecosystem, not just to those that want the change, but also, and more importantly, to those that haven't asked for the change. We need to consider stakeholders' capacity to cope with changes, as well as considering the time and resources put into their implementation. To help with this, earlier this year, the IESB published its key priorities for the next five years after analyzing feedback from our third agenda consultation. What we heard is that we should keep our current balance of activities. And I mentioned that to some of you in the break, that the ISB, whilst it is recognized as the global standard setter, spends only around 45% of its activities in developing standards. The rest of our work is going elsewhere, maintenance, stakeholder outreach, digital, and things like that. We have heard that we should slightly increase the work on digital reporting and accessibility, which we will do. And furthermore, we were told to bring projects on the work plan to completion before starting any new major project. That includes carrying out the post-implementation reviews on IFRS 9, financial instruments, IFRS 15 on revenue from contracts with customers, and IFRS 16 on leases. Notwithstanding the strong calls that we should finish our current projects as a priority, we were also asked to add projects that respond to significant changes in the environment and work in collaboration with our new sibling, the ISSB. So how have we shown that we are listening to the feedback? We are busy working to complete the 20 projects that we currently have on our work plan, and I wish you to memorize the number 20. To just pick on two, the primary financial statements project is well on track and will greatly enhance transparency and prove comparability about the performance reporting globally. We hope to be able to conclude our technical discussions next year, so stay tuned. Change is coming. Significant decisions have also been made in the Goodwill and Impairment Project. Having considered all the feedback obtained, we decided to retain the current impairment-only model of accounting for goodwill and to propose requiring a comprehensive set of disclosures and IFS3 business combinations to inform investors about the subsequent performance of an acquisition the biggest question that remains unanswered still until today. These two decisions, no doubt, will enable the ISB to move the project to standard setting shortly. In fact, we are being asked to make that decision next week. The IASB is also being responsive to shareholders and stakeholders where accelerated responses are needed. Examples in that area are work on clarifying how to apply the classification criteria to so-called ESG-linked instruments under IFRS 9, an issue that is obviously of great importance to Europe. But we seek to publish an exposure draft early in the second quarter of next year. Another area concerns providing companies temporary relief from having to calculate deferred taxes related to so-called OECD Pillar 2 tax requirements. This relief concerns the period between the enactment and the effective date of such tax regulation introduced by jurisdictions and should greatly help the adoption of this important OECD initiative, again, working in the public interest. Given the urgency, we will publish an exposure draft with a common period of just 60 days rather than the 120 days in early January with the aim of finalizing the amendment in the second quarter of 2023. This may be unwarranted to many of you, that do have a financial reporting close, but we, we think that there's no alternative in bringing about the relief in time when first jurisdictions move and actually in, um, initiate these tax changes. 
Also in responding to stakeholders, uh, we are advancing post-implementation reviews. I've already said that. The first phase of our uh, post-implementation review on IFRS 9 is almost complete, and the second phase on impairment had been initiated. The PIR on IFRS 15 is also progressing. And decisions will be made regarding the PIRs on 16 and the hedge accounting phase of IFRS 9 in the second half of 2023. We decided for a different timing for two reasons. Firstly, this will allow for further evidence to be submitted to the IASB, which we think uh, is really necessary in that regard. But also, we want stakeholders to have capacity um, to engage fully with us, so we deliberately decided to stagger the different projects um, in order not to overpower our stakeholders. As I already mentioned, stakeholders gave their suggestions for new projects for the IASB to consider working on. Remember the 20. How well they did. We received suggestions for some 70 new projects. Seven, zero. We have 20 on, the, on our agenda. We are at full capacity. In a judicious effort to listen to stakeholders' feedback to prioritize completing projects currently on the work plan, we took a tough decision and only added two projects to the ISB's research agenda. These projects focus on the statement of cash flows and on intangible assets, which I know uh, have both been priorities for EFRAC, so another very uh, good outcome, I think, for Europe. These projects reflect major changes in our environment, such as new business models, the growing importance of intellectual property, the rise of both the digital economy and non-cash transactions, to just cite a few issues. We also added a maintenance project on climate-related risks in financial reporting to explore whether our principle-based literature, IS-1 in this case, could benefit from refinements when it comes to considering long-term non-financial risks in the financial statements more broadly. So don't look for a standard on climate-related risk in our part of the literature. We leave that to Emmanuel and his team. But there may well be changes in our literature to IS-1 to facilitate the connectedness of the two pieces. All in all, the ISB has certainly tried to defer to feedback that less is more. Be cognizant about how much change you roll out. And finally, feedback has also concluded that stakeholders want to see collaboration between the IASB and the ISSB. Collaborating with the ISSB is an area many stakeholders flagged in various consultations, whether it was the agenda consultation, whether it was when the ISSB was erected, or on our project on management commentary. For us, connectivity is primarily important from a product angle, which means the information produced by the IASB and the ISSB must connect product. The process angle as to how we get to that answer is important, but should not be the primary focus. We have put senior staff resources from both boards onto this to make sure that the machine room is ready once the bridge has capacity to start the topical discussions, probably sometime next year. This preparation includes reviewing each other's board's papers and exchanging and forming information about each board's key agenda items and decisions. I hope that those of you that are commenting on the ISSB's agenda consultation that will be published early next year will mirror the feedback that we have received on the IASB agenda consultation regarding working together on projects such as management commentary, intangible assets, or climate-related risks. Let me conclude. The ISB and indeed the IFRS Foundation look forward to working with EFRAC to continue the work in maintaining and further enhancing a global financial reporting language and to foster one global capital market, and that was referenced this morning several times. Our mutual objective, I think. It has been an incredibly fulfilling and pivotal relationship thus far. Long may it continue. Virtual glass i raise here's to the next 20 years of this special relationship and i wish you all at afrag a wonderful anniversary thank, uh, celebration and thank you very much for listening
Okay, all right. So um, I don't know whether you see the questions. I read them out. The first one was connectivity of financial information and sustainability is crucial for the concept of value creation. How do bo both boards jointly take this into account? Now, the first thing is to say that the ISSB has recently disbanded the reliance on the term value creation because it has created confusion <laughs> in standard setting. So what they have rather said is they have reverted back to what we say about um, the objective of uh, general purpose financial reporting that we do have in the conceptual framework and an IS-1, and they had copied over that language into their standard. So there's no longer talk about value creation. It's really about bringing the uh, decision useful information to those um, that need it to make informed decisions. So that's, of course, a good thing. Second question, can you share what work we are doing to ensure connectivity between EFRAX, uh, ESRS, and the international financial reporting standards? That's a, that's a difficult question, right? Because um, there is an underlying assumption that there is actually a crossover from the ESRS into IFRS financial reporting standards. I don't say that there isn't. There may be, and I think there probably is. And for the same projects probably that I've just outlined and management commentary, intangible assets, climate-related risks, are there just three. But I think we have to be mindful when wherever we talk about working together with the ISSB, and I'm just now selfishly looking on my side, on my pillar, IASB and ISSB, we don't think that we would really wake up together, have breakfast together, start the day together, discuss everything together, and then leave the office together, right? I think that probably 90%, 95% of each board's doing, they can do on their own. There will be subjects where arguably it is of utmost importance that we get the borderline between the two reporting pillars right. And Emmanuel this morning referred to financial reporting in general being backward looking and sustainability reporting being uh, forward looking. I think that's approximately right because it doesn't uh, entirely resonate as some of financial reporting obviously also peaks into the future, but our horizon is different. So what we want to make sure is that with our two different sets of information, we don't confuse the users when they receive the information about one and the same company. In the company saying a completely different message with regard to medium to long-term strategy, vis-a-vis -vis what they read in the notes to the financial statements or in the general outlook. That's really, I think, what we should be concentrating on. Not so much of, okay, how much of your literature on climate do I steal and take into account so that there's also features in the notes. I think that's not really the job, right? We do not really replicate what the other board is doing, but we try to be really commensurate and um, work in tandem. Now, as I said, I cannot rule out that there will be other issues. If you think about decommissioning liabilities, a standard that we do have, for instance, uh, that cer certainly does have an angle, but it doesn't mean that we can't do anything. It may well be that one board moves ahead informs the other board, and then the other board follows suit based on the decisions that the other board has made. And the one example I could give you here is the one on climate-related risks. We have decided at the IASB to stand still and wait until the ISSB finishes their S2 standard so that we know what the decisions have been made, what the disclosure requirements will be, so that we then can form the necessary bridge uh, in building the requirements out for financial reporting. There's two more questions. Shall I go on? Yeah, uh, I could okay. go the entire day. Okay, so I'm your new conference day. All right, excellent, wonderful. Okay, so next question. How do you foresee the six integrated reporting capitals to feature more obviously across accounting sustainability reporting standards? That's a very good question. Oh, I have many people in my organization that would love to talk to this topic. Now, just to put this into perspective, when the ISSB came into existence, several things happened at the same time. One was obviously the standard setter was formed, the people were selected, the first two topics were changed. But there's one other thing that has happened, and that related um, to the merger of the Value Reporting Foundation into the IFRS Foundation. And by that means, we inherited the literature from the former Integrated Reporting Council, and that's the Integrated Reporting Framework. Both Emmanuel and I have put out a statement that we would be foolish to just set this aside because it simply doesn't fit our existing literature. 
Of course, it isn't an accounting standard. It isn't a sustainability standard. It's something special. And we keep it as special for the time being until we know what to do. However, we just don't leave it hanging, but we draw regularly from the principles in the integrated reporting framework when we consider driving reporting forward, when we write disclosures. And if you want to see a good example of that, I urge you to really look into the uh, ISSB's work on S1 and S2, because they really have made use of the integrated reporting framework, and we will do exactly the same. I probably should come to an end, because I see that a far more distinguished speaker than me has arrived. <laughs> So I shall now pause and hand it back to Hans. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, before I give the floor to the commissioner, we agreed that we would show you a short movie of Jean-Paul Gauzès, who unluckily cannot be here. And he has been for a number of years or uh, chairman who we respect to the highest extent. And it is Jean-Paul that also implemented the full, let's say, changes to the FRAC. So your attention for a short movie of Jean-Paul Gauzès. Thank you. Madame la Commissaire, ladies and gentlemen, I will regret not being able to be with you as this measure event with March 21 years of FRAC and especially its new mission in the field of sustainability standards. I am delighted to have been able, before the end of my mandate on the end of June this year, to carry out the implementation of the recommendations that I had outlined within the framework of the mission handed to me by Vice President Dombrovskis and subsequently confirmed by Commissioner Martinez. I would like to take the opportunity to warmly thank Vice President Dombrovskis and Commissioner Martinez for their trust. My gratitude and my thanks also go to all those who, during my term of office, and in particular during the second period, provide me their expertise and support. Amongst others, Sasia Slump, Hans Boyce. I am to thinking of the representatives of the member organization of EFRAC, the member of the board and tax, the staff of EFRAC, and all the members of the working groups. I had also the pleasure of working closely and efficiently with the representative of the European Commission, who I am salute. Hugo, Alain, Sven, Tom, Jean-Christophe. Today, Madame Commissioner, in application of the CSRD, EFRAG as a new mission, as a service of the European Commission. EFRAG, which was already its advisor for financial reporting standard, is now also its advisor for the preparation of sustainability standards. Even if EFRAC is not strictly speaking the European standard setter, it play and will play an essential role in the preparation of the draft sustainability standards, which after various consultations will be adopted by Delegate Act. The first projects initially drawn up by the task force and shared by Patrick de Tambour, were adopted under special condition. And within a very short time, the draft sustainability standards are the result of the work carried out by motivated teams made up mainly of voluntaries providing free collaboration in kind. The EFRAC SRB <coughs> and EFRAC SR tech took over under the same condition. They were able to perfect and finalize the project within the tight deadline imposed by the Commission's schedule. Allow me, Madam Commissioner, to thank you with all due respect 
that this kind of performance has limits. The European Sustainability Report Standard Project deserves the means allowing it to develop itself under normal conditions, consistent with the legitimate ambitions of the European Union as displayed by the Green Deal policy. In order for EFRAC, as a public-private partnership, to be able to pursue its mission effectively, public funding must be commensurate with the importance of the mission and trusted to it for the development of European regulation. I have no doubt, Madam Commissioner, that you will see to it. Before concluding, I would like to welcome the new president of the Technical Board. Lieber Wolf Klins, mein lieber Freund, Sie sollten der ersten Präsident der EFRAG nach der Verabschiedung der von Philipp Mechstadt vorgeschlagene Reform werden. Vorübergehende gesundheitliche Probleme haben Sie daran gehindert. Nun sind wir wieder hier, um den Vorsitz EFRAG FRB zu übernehmen. Ich bin sicher, dass Sie die gleiche Kompetenz und Dynamik in EFRAG einbringen werden, die ich erlebt habe, als wir gemeinsam im Europäischen Parlament saßen. Wir gehörten zwar nicht derselben Fraktion an, aber wir waren beide Mitglieder der ECON. So hatten wir oft die Gelegenheit, gemeinsam an besonders wichtigen Finanzdossiers zu arbeiten. Da haben habe ich ausgezeichnete Erinnerungen. Ich wünsche Ihnen viel Erfolg für diesen neuen Aufgabenbereich, den Vorsitz der EFRA Financial Reporting Board im Dienst Europas. Cher Präsident Patrick de Tambour, cher Patrick, je suis heureux particulièrement de ta désignation comme président du nouveau Board Durabilité. Cette désignation vient récompenser le travail impressionnant qui a été le tien dans la phrase préparatoire. Tu as animé brillamment les travaux de la task force constituée à la demande du vice-président Dombrovski, puis à celle de Madame McGuinness, pour préparer les premiers projets de normes. La tâche qui s'attend ne sera pas simple, elle ne sera pas non plus facile. Mais je crois bien te connaître, comme disent nos amis belges, tu livreras. Bon vent à toi Fidèle ami. Madame Commissioner, you now have the floor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and I will be very, very brief. First of all, thank you very much, Jean Paul, for these nice words. We will remain in contact. May I introduce you, Commissioner Merit McGuinness? who is our European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. And her vision specifically for the portfolio is focused on ensuring the financial sector's strength and stability so that it can deliver for people, society and the environment. The floor is yours. Thank you. So I have my marching orders from Mr. Guzes, um, and can I just say a huge thank you to him and for a fantastic uh, presentation here today. It would have been great were he here, but I think he made a bigger impression because it was big on screen. And he has set out an agenda for me. I will address some of his requests, but I'll keep you waiting. Um, actually, it's incredible to be in a room with so many people. And uh, it was quite warm when I walked in, but that's the body temperature, perhaps, or the enthusiasm of this gathering. Um, and I re was recalling as I walked through that the last 21st celebration that I attended was my son's in March. Uh, they weren't all sitting as orderly, but it was a nice celebration. Uh, and I know that COVID interrupted us getting together, even marking the 20th. So I think it's nice that we are together for this 21st uh, celebration and indeed to look at the past, but also to look to the future. Um, and that's why we're here, as I say, to celebrate, but look um, to look 
onwards. Uh, what I would really uh, say for EFRAG, in your 21 years, and certainly your work with us in the Commission, we've had the value of all that you have delivered to us. You've been a vital part of our, uh, your work in financial reporting has helped us in the Commission with technical advice um, um, on international financial reporting standards. And if I recall the figure, you've provided us with endorsement advice more than 120 times. So that is a body of work. And that work, um, uh, through that work, you've made a very important contribution to the European Union single market. And as you know, the single market will soon celebrate its 30th birthday. So thank you for your contribution to that. You've also become influential on global financial reporting standards setting, including your work with the IFRS. Recently, and I think this uh, represents your coming of age, we've asked you to take on a new role on sustainability reporting. And I have to say, as Jean-Paul uh, outlined, you've risen to the challenge, delivering the first set of draft European sustainability reporting standards just a couple of weeks ago. So today I want to talk about the wider context uh, of the work you do, specifically on the importance of corporate reporting that includes both sustainability and financial information on an equal footing, where we stand on sustainability reporting and the prospect for financial reporting. So I'll begin with the corporate reporting, um, which is at the very heart of the financial system. Accurate, uh, verified information is vital for internal management and, of course, for external scrutiny of investors and auditors. Simple but important issues like how much a company is making, whether the company meets their targets and growth, uh, what the share price is. Today, of course, financial information is increasingly complemented by information on sustainability, including looking at a company's uh, climate emissions, whether the company board is gender balanced, and how employees in their supply chain are treated. Both sets of information are important and should work together. Just as we shouldn't focus only on the profitability of a company, sustainability by itself does not provide enough information either. So it's not one or the other. We need companies that are both sustainable and profitable. We want every part of the economy and the financial system to get on board and help us become more sustainable. And this is very much part of the European Green Deal. This is a, a deal about um, supporting jobs, growth, and investment in a way that is sustainable and in a way that contributes to reaching net zero by 2050. And so moving corporate reporting towards combining financial and sustainability information is fully in line with our Green Deal. And EFRAG is very well placed to look at the links between these two sets of company data given your role on both financial and sustainability reporting. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows it well, this is really a major step forward in corporate reporting. And if I recall that today, if you like, companies can pick and choose between many different standards. Uh, the directive uh, takes uh, all of that uh, choice away but gives clarity and certainty to companies. Uh, it takes account of the need for companies to report on sustainability. The Parliament and, as you know, the Council recently approved the final text of the directive, which should be published before the end of this year. So it is a very big piece of work, and I do want to congratulate everyone involved, particularly the French Presidency and the Parliament's rapporteur, Pascal Durand, for very intensive and good work. For the first time ever, sustainability reporting will be on an equal footing with financial reporting. The new directive covers large companies and listed companies. Listed M SMEs will report, but they will get more time to adjust and more proportionate expectations on what they need to report. The information reported will be made available in a digital format, and this will make it easily accessible to anyone interested in seeing it. Companies will have to get an assurance opinion on their sustainability reporting. This will improve the reliability of the information and will reduce the risk of greenwashing. And so we're asking auditors and other independent assurance providers to take on an important role in verifying sustainability information. We know that this implies some costs, so we're taking a very gradual approach in this area. 
We're starting with a requirement for limited assurance, followed by reasonable assurance. And at the very heart of the directive are European sustainability reporting standards. And again, I want to thank EFRAG for the timely submission of the first 12 draft standards a few weeks ago. This is another major milestone. In particular, thanks to Kirsten Opata on her role as acting chair of EFRAG Sustainability Reporting Board. And of course, thanks to Patrick de Chambourg, who recently was appointed as the new chair. And indeed, we've had very good engagement, and I wish you every success. These standards will allow companies to report in a systematic, credible, and comparable manner about their sustainability performance. The drafts reflect a high degree of consensus amongst the stakeholders in EFRAG, including companies, investors, auditors, civil society and trade unions. And they cover the full range of sustainability issues, environment, including climate, social and human rights and governance. As is required by the directive, the standards take a double materiality perspective, and this is a European approach uh, to sustainability. They oblige companies to report both on their impacts on people and the environment, but also to report on how social and environmental issues create financial risks or indeed opportunities for the company. The standards have to be proportionate and understandable. And they have to strike the right balance between the information that users need and the burden on those preparing the information. Consistency with international standards is a priority since the beginning of the process. There is already intensive cooperation with the International Sustainability Standards Board, ISSB. We've had technical discussions between the ISSB, the Commission and EFRAG on the links between European and global standards. It is one of my frequently asked questions in Europe and globally about the interoperability and we of course take this really seriously. The draft European standards take these discussions into account. The idea is to establish an interoperability mapping table between the two sets of disclosure requirements once the European and international climate reporting standards are finalised. We aim to adopt the European standards by the middle of next year, as you said, by way of a delegated act. We've requested opinions from EU bodies, as is required under the directive, including ESMA, EBA, IOPA and the European Environment Agency. We'll also talk to Member States and the European Parliament. The standards will start applying for the first companies in financial year 2024 for reports published in 2025. And so we are on course to meet our ambitious timeline to revolutionise sustainability reporting in the European Union. But we also know that good standard setting requires adequate resources. And here I hope Jean-Paul is still listening to me. Within our financing rules and the budget ceilings fixed by the Parliament and Council, we are making every effort to increase the amount of EU funding for EFRAG's work on sustainability reporting. The Commission has also been looking at corporate reporting as a whole, including its quality and its enforcement. Wirecard and other recent cases demonstrates what happens if corporate governance, statutory audit and or supervision are not up to the task. These failures hurt investors. Uh, they trusted not only the information companies supplied, but also that the wider system around it would verify that information. And the collapse of companies has wider ramifications, in particular for trust in capital markets. And indeed this morning we've launched another proposals on the Capital Markets Union. We need high quality, reliable corporate reporting that is consistent across the single market. This is an issue of investor and consumer confidence and protection. I am glad to see the interest our work on this topic has attracted, including a high number of responses to the public consultation. And there are already a number of takeaways from this consultation process. First, there is a lot of support for the holistic approach that we've taken. We included all three pillars of the corporate reporting ecosystem, corporate governance, auditing and supervision. These pillars support and reinforce one another. Second, there is a lot of interest in better risk management and internal controls in companies and in strengthening the responsibilities of the boards to ensure good corporate reporting. There is clearly room for improvement in corporate governance. Thirdly, auditors carry out an essential task in the public interest. 
We reformed the EU rules on audit after the global financial crisis. Today, we're publishing a study on their implementation. Although progress has been made, there are still issues that we need to look at further. For example, implementation is different across member states due to the many options available under the audit regulation. The study also um, shows significant differences in supervisory approaches. There are challenges for companies working in multiple member states, both for audit firms and for the companies being audited. And it means that investor protection is not consistent either. We also know there is still a high level of concentration in the audit mar uh, market. In the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, we will open the audit market for sustainability standards to independent assurance service providers. When the Commission talked to stakeholders, there was also a lot of attention on issues around market structure and fragmentation in the single market. However, there was less attention on how to improve audit quality, a difficult area, but one where we do need to dig into a little bit deeper. Finally, on supervision. Many stakeholders agree that there is a need to increase information exchange and cooperation between competent authorities and the need for more transparency. These are all very complex issues. We need to deepen our assessment of the problems with the audit framework that relates to the three pillars of the corporate reporting system, as well as how they relate to each other. And we need more time to build consensus on policy options. We in the Commission will continue to engage with stakeholders and follow a full holistic approach that covers the whole corporate reporting ecosystem. We also need to be mindful that our political agenda has been heavily impacted by the geopolitical and economic outlook. So as I close my short uh, remarks to you today, the prospects for corporate reporting in Europe are positive. Again, I want to congratulate EFRAG for your work over the last 21 years on global financial reporting standards and on your work, your very recent work, in the drafting of European sustainability reporting standards. I think we can look to the future, conscious that the world ahead of us is very different, we hope, than the one today, but very certain that for companies, for the financial system, that counting isn't enough, that taking account of sustainability issues matters as much as the profitability. I said that in my opening remarks and I repeat it because it is a fundamental shift in mindset. Many companies were already on this path and were choosing standards uh, to try and help them provide information uh, flows to investors and clients. Uh, I think what we've done collectively, Commission, European Parliament, Council, uh, working with EFRAG, is provide a very solid guidance for companies as to what they need to report and how they need to report it. And this will reduce costs because today there are many, many uh, choices and options. Um, it is a big task, both for those who draft the standards, and EFRAG have, have really um, stood up to that task. It is now our duty to reflect and to issue delegated acts, as we said, by uh, the first half of next year. And we hope that in a very short period of time, when people are looking at a report digitally, that they will see the importance of both sets of standards. Um, and of course, in the beginning, around sustainability, there were many different views. We have clarified in our standards and our work on taxonomy uh, more clarity around these issues. Um, and if anything, I think we have learned in this year in particular uh, what it means to be sustainable, what it means to be resilient. Uh, and again, I really want to appreciate the work of EFRAG and our thanks uh, to our on-screen Jean-Paul, to Herr Klintz, whom I know, very familiar faces from, from European Parliament, and to all the colleagues here that I know, and the many I don't know. Thank you for your attention and for your um, engagement on what is something that will change, not just the business world, but change the world, and very much for the better. Thank you. We would like, you, if, if it's easy for you, we can also bring in there. Oh, yes, yes. Here's Perfect. Fine. Uh, we would like to ask uh, a couple of questions, if possible. Uh, that the first one is tackling the climate and the biodiversity problems needs high 
Ah, but now it's working. It wasn't working. So tackling the climate and the biodiversity problems needs high investments, public, but above all private. To what extent will the capital markets reward these investments? And to what extent will the new disclosure regimes contribute to an improved allocation of capital? Okay, I think it's a very simple answer. You need information to make good decisions. We're now providing um, the basis to give that information. We already have it with financial. We now will have it with sustainability. But on the wider um, question you raise about the need for massive investments uh, towards sustainability, both climate, which is also linked with biodiversity, um, I, I rather think of it the opposite way. If we don't invest, what will we have? Nothing. If we don't invest, and it's, I was encouraged as I uh, drove here that there's a, a report that says the investments in wind and renewables has been magnified by several factors because of what has happened this year. The illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia has really um, alerted us to the fact that we're not resilient when it comes to our energy needs. So this is a, not a matter of choice, this is a matter of must. And our work on Capital Markets Union recognises the need for Europe to have deeper, more liquid capital markets, not only to rely on bank finance. So I think that when you put the pieces of the work we're doing within FISMA and link it with our environment colleagues and climate colleagues, uh, it, it, it creates a very clear picture. And what's really important is that no sector stands alone. Uh, and indeed, it's, I think it's very interesting that the financial system is the backbone of much of the um, efforts around sustainability. And without a solid financial system, capital markets and banks, we're not going to be able to deliver the capital that is required. So I hope I've addressed um, how important disclosures are. And I think this is maybe just if I had a red flag, I would say that, you know, it's no longer t um, good enough to look good. You really have to clarify that by proving with the information that you are delivering. I also would add that it's really important that companies understand that this is a process to help people transition their companies towards what is sustainable. This is not saying if you don't meet criteria today, you're out. It actually means we have guidance to allow you invest towards sustainability. And indeed, you can uh, map uh, management plans based on taxonomy and on, on other of our measures. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid that you already responded to my second question indirectly. But the second question was, we are currently living indeed in uncertain times, as you referred to, with rising interest rates and unexpectedly high energy prices. Uh, as a consequence, pressure is building up on the financial sector. And then, of course, our question is, how can financial reporting ensure that the resilience, risk mitigation, capability and capacity to finance transitions of the financial sector are not in danger? OK, um, let me reflect on what happened during the COVID pandemic. I think we were all very nervous as to what would happen, of course, health wise, but also what would happen to our systems. And clearly we saw supply chain problems in the in the structural sector in the financial system. There was an incredible reaction. Those who are not digital went digital, and the, the, both the companies and the individuals. So we were connected uh, perfectly to the financial system. And indeed, banks were great uh, conduits for the support that governments were providing for companies and individuals. And we emerged out of COVID, maybe expecting high unemployment and, and concern around financial stability. We saw neither. And the reason we didn't see a problem in the financial system was because we had put in place regulations tough regulations after the financial crash. I mean, there was a period in January where Europe was looking really strong, growth was you know, going to be very impressive. And then I've mentioned this illegal invasion of Ukraine. And we think of the people of Ukraine today who are being frozen in their homes. Um, but that changed a lot. So it led to huge concern, obviously, for Ukraine. We reacted with sanctions. But what it has led to over these months is uncertainty. And you can see that in the markets. So people are uncertain. I've been very conscious that the energy crisis, because we certainly have one, we have managed um, to build our stores of gas and we're managing to invest and we're, we're doing lots of important things. But I was conscious that if there was a crisis in the energy sector, it might bleed into the financial system. And I've been, we've been avoiding that by being aware that it could happen. So lots of the work we've done around um, energy markets uh, and derivatives and, and, and margins, et cetera, has been towards providing support, but also cognizant that there, uh, we had to avoid any spillover. Uh, and I think today we can say that while we have uncertainty, the system 
is solid. But of course, in a time of uncertainty and beyond, uh, everyone is watching and the market is very nervous. But I go back to my central point here. Um, you know, we don't have a choice. The only path that we can take is the one towards addressing our lack of resilience on energy, which is linked to the climate challenge, and addressing biodiversity issues. So there isn't another path, and it needs finance. And I think uh, you know those in policy uh, have to make sure that the financial system remains robust. And we have to see other areas where we have concerns. So of course we engage with all of the regulatory authorities, both at the European level and at the national level. Um, so my hope for next year, I mean, of course, I think we would all hope that this horrible war would end for the people of Ukraine. Um, but I do think we need to learn our lessons around resilience, um, around time, because the right time to change is now, not to wait, as we have tended to do for some time. Because it does seem we now have the capacity to increase our investments very significantly in renewable energies. You wonder why we hadn't that capacity in January. But we have it now, so let's use it, let's use it wisely. But I don't underestimate the amount of finance that's needed and the intricacies of the supply chain, including around renewables, and on the pressure on governments, given that they need to support citizens and businesses. So it's a time for, um, I, I recall during COVID when the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and we were all going through quite uh, traumatic times, and she would say, we need strong nerves. And I think that will get you through. We have a, a, a situation to face into, um, and we have to face it because there's no turning back. So both for the financial system and corporates, and maybe I should say a word for SMEs while I have an opportunity, because you probably won't ask. I think you don't need two questions, <laughs> but you might. Um, one of the things, messages I'd like to get across is I know there's a lot of concern in, in the SME community around all of this. They, they're fearful, and, and this is very understandable. So I, I would make two points. Um, um, the first one is we're not mandating that SMEs, other than listed, have to apply any of these uh, sustainability standards. But I don't want to exclude that SMEs might want to use standards. So we will provide proportionate standards that can be used by SMEs. But I would say to the bigger companies who have more resources on this topic, that they, in my view, have a duty of care to all in their supply chain, SMEs, to work with them so that they are on the sustainability path too, because that will matter. Um, and I know that may, you know, when companies are paying high energy prices and are concerned about uh, supply chain, the, the problems today are enormous. But I, I give that message because I don't want to exclude our SMEs. They're the backbone of the European economy. Uh, they want to survive into the future, and we have to help them on this journey without forcing or mandating. Uh, there is a good way forward for SMEs, um, so I hope that message resonates. Have you another question? I wouldn't even dare. <laughs> okay. I thank you very much, and a big applause for Gov <laughs> Commissioner McGuinness. We're a little bit early, but that is better than being late. So we have a break that we will start now, but maybe stop also exactly 15 minutes before the original time. So the duration of the break is the same. Thank you very much. So it means we normally had a break from 3.30 to 4, if I'm not mistaken, we do quarter past 3 to quarter to 4. Thank you.
et hé, un, deux.
Ladies and gentlemen, sorry to rush you, but we would love to start again. The best banking analyst in Sweden, he called me a lot previously to, to ask for it, <laughs> well, to get a full understanding. So. Yeah, well, that's good. We need to be able to understand I'm still some people the numbers. I mean, I can't describe the numbers, but I can like room changes and so on. Absolutely. So in okay, welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, we move to our third panel. Third panel specifically on financial reporting and connectivity. But before we start that panel, there will be first a introductory speech made by uh, Mrs. Verena Ross, the chair of ESMA. Uh, Virinaros is representing the authority as well as preparing the work of and chairing its board of supervisors and management board. She has been in already since 20, 2011, and between 2011 and 2021, she served as ESMA's first executive director. I will give Virinaros immediately the floor, and as soon as you are finished, I will give over to my colleague, Chairman Wolf Klintz, who will then lead the panel. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, thank you to EFRAC and thank you for that introduction. It's great to be here with you today and join this conference. Before I introduce the topic of financial reporting and connectivity, which the next panel will deal with, I would like to join in the festive spirit that has been going through this conference and uh, congratulate EFRAC um, for its 21st anniversary. It's really fantastic to be here with you today. And I would I, like to also congratulate the two new board uh, chairs, Wolf Klintz and Patrick de Cambourg, for their appointment. So congratulations again. EFRAC has certainly come a long way during the last two decades. But I believe that the past few years have been critical in establishing EFRAC as a reference point for various European stakeholders with an interest in corporate reporting and to help bringing sustainability reporting to the same level of rigor and maturity as financial reporting. Today, therefore, we not only celebrate the longevity and the success of the organization, but we also recognize Europe's ability to join forces in delivering on an ambitious sustainability, sustainable finance agenda to support the much needed transition towards a more sustainable economy. It is with this joint effort in mind that since the establishment of the European Corporate Reporting Lab in 2018, we at ESMA have actively contributed to the new sustainability reporting work stream in EFRAC. This work stream was formalized earlier this year with the creation of the new pillar led by the Sustainability Reporting Board, where ESMA is represented alongside other public bodies as an official observer. Our participation in this work aims at ensuring that the European sustainability reporting standards that EFRAC is developing are conducive to investor protection and that they do not undermine financial stability. This dual objective will form the basis also of the opinion that we are due to give on the ESRS as just submitted and successfully submitted by EFRAC to the Commission. One area among others that our opinion on the ESRS will touch upon is precisely the issue of connectivity between sustainability information most notably, obviously, climate-related information and financial information, which lets me to move to the topic of the next panel. In my view, the issue of connectivity relates to at least three main aspects. First, the consistency of different pieces of information conveyed through different parts of the annual financial report, most notably the financial statements, the management report, and the non-financial statement. Secondly, the use of cross-referencing and digitalization to better understand the interconnections among different pieces of information. And thirdly, the rules, controls, and supervisory measures aimed at promoting connectivity across an issuer's annual financial report. Let me very briefly touch upon each of these points. 
So on the first point of consistency of content, in the past years, ESMA has progressively strengthened its work to promote a careful assessment by issuers of the effects of climate-related matters in their financial statements. We've also promoted greater consistency between these disclosures and the information provided elsewhere in the annual financial report. This increased focus responds to the growing scrutiny from investors on knowing more about the financial effects of climate-related matters on issuers. In order to be able to take informed investment decisions, in fact, users of financial statements are increasingly requesting more information to better understand how the year-on-year -year financial performance and position of an issuer matches with the strategic commitments made to embrace the climate transition. Such a transition is expected to require, depending on the sectors, significant investments in greener plants, equipment and processes, and changes to existing business models. It is urgent to bring financial reporting up to speed with these emerging needs of investors. ESMA also acknowledge that in embracing this change, issuers will need to go through quite a steep learning curve which may affect the speed with which transparency improvements can be observed. In this respect, particularly in the last two years, we have called for due consideration by issuers and their auditors of the educational material published in November 2020 by the IASB, in which it is explained how the different IFRSs would require the reflection of the impact of climate-related matters on the issuers uh, reported performance, financial position, and cash flows. More recently, in the 2022 enforcement priorities, we highlighted the importance of reflecting climate-related matters in the accounting for impairments of non-financial assets and provisions. These are two of the accounting areas that are most exposed to the impact that climate-related physical and transition risks may have. We also emphasize that issuers should consider whether the degree of emphasis placed on climate-related matters in the management report and in the non-financial information is consistent with the extent of disclosure on how these same risks and opportunities have been reflected in the judgments and estimates applied within the financial statements. This is particularly relevant as ESMA and European enforcers more generally have, encouraged, have encountered situations where issuers have put in their public communications to the market significant emphasis on climate-related objectives, but with no or at least very little information on the related impacts within the financial statements. Let me move to the second aspect of cross-referencing and digitalization. It is important that this consistency in substance that I just spoke about is further supported by practical measures to make the interconnections across information more visible and easier to retrieve. In this respect, the first set of draft European sustainability reporting standards certainly includes requirements to explain the sustainability state in the sustainability statements the consistency between the expected financial effects of sustainability related impacts risks and opportunities and any corresponding information from the financial statements furthermore the esrs will also allow for the use of cross referencing to amounts presented within the financial statements so there's certainly a lot of connectivity the digitalization on both sides of the annual financial reports, i.e. the financial statements, and in the future, the sustainability statements, will further support the understanding of how sustainability <coughs> claims in the front end of the annual financial report relates to the information disclosed in the back end of the report. It is therefore essential to accelerate the work to extend the European single electronic format requirements also to sustainability statements. And we certainly look forward to working with FRAC on that endeavor. Before joining the panel for what I'm sure will be an interesting discussion, let me just spend the last few words on the third aspect of connectivity related to how existing rules and controls, and in particular, supervisory practices can foster the development of more and better connected information in the issuer's financial reports. In response to the strong investor demands 
for more meaningful financial statements with respect to climate risks, ESMA has actively engaged in discussions with national competent authorities. We've also talked with auditors and with non-governmental organizations to better understand what are the perceived shortcomings in the current reporting landscape and what are the possible hurdles to connectivity and consistency. Based on these interactions, our understanding is that the principles-based nature of IFRS already caters for the reporting of material information on risks and opportunities relating to climate. In other words, in our view, the existing requirements today already allow, if not require, issuers to build such connectivity in the financial statements. Nevertheless, it is definitely good to see that the ISB has planned, as I understand, to add to its work plan in the horizon 2022-26, a limited scope project on climate-related risks in financial statements, which will consider whether and, if so, what narrow scope actions might be needed in relation to accounting for climate-related risks in the financial statements. Against this background, our intervention at this stage has been to develop recommendations that would give the clear message to issuers and their auditors that we believe that IFRS already have all it needs to reflect climate-related matters. We've channeled these recommendations through our public statements that I already referred to. Going forward, I believe that the role of the supervisors needs to be one of gradual but continued and steady push to improve the level of transparency on the financial implications of climate-related matters in the financial statements. Lastly, let me emphasize the key role of two important groups of actors in the corporate reporting process to foster connectivity. One relates to the members of the administrative management and supervisory boards of the issuers. These bodies should keep a close eye on their connectivity and consistency between sustainability and financial reporting. The other group is represented by the external auditors. Here I want to emphasize and encourage the key educational role that this profession can play vis-a-vis -vis their clients to stimulate efforts to properly reflect climate-related matters in the financial statements. And with that, I'm sure we will touch on further issues like that in the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Verena, uh, very much for your introductory words. Let me first of all present myself very briefly. I'm very grateful to uh, Jean-Paul Gosset, who found very warm words for me. Uh, we've worked very productively together, as a matter of fact. Uh, he, uh, representing the French Republicans, I'm representing the German Liberals, and both being coordinators for their respective uh, political groups. Uh, he made only one mistake. Uh, he addressed me rather formally using the German word of C, which, uh, <laughs> which of course, many of you that don't German won't understand it, but which, of course, was never the case. We have always been on a first name basis, on s'est tutoyé, and not used the book. Anyhow, so, <laughs> anyhow, as you, as uh, some of you that have known me uh, when I was an MEP know, uh, remember, I've joined the parliament after more than 30 years in business and stayed in the parliament being member of the Econ Committee from 2004 to 2019 and uh, worked primarily on, on financial issues and also chaired the, the Special Crisis Committee in two, from 2009 till 2011. As Commissioner McGuinness outlined, we are living in, time -changing, in a time-changing period. Uh, the world that we have known until the beginning of February this year does not exist anymore. We, we had to learn the hard way that uh, having access to abundant energy resources at reasonable prices is no longer guaranteed. We feel that security uh, is not guaranteed anymore. We even realize that militarily, without the support of the United States of America for the time being, we would be lost. So in fact, times really, uh, there is really a time-changing period. And of course, the other uh, topic that has popped up re in recent months and maybe already years is the climate question. 
Today in Montreal, the International Conference on Biodiversity starts. We are losing every day 150, up to 150 species uh, uh, indefinitely. Now, uh, and we ha are having the, the major climate problem, as you all know. If we do not change course, we will be in serious trouble much faster than we expect today. The mankind has this year crossed, or is crossing this year, six of the so-called planetary lines. That means that we uh, might reach the point of no return, or of an extremely difficult return, rather quickly. So something has to be done, and therefore it is only natural, it was high time in a way, that uh, uh, the uh, approach also how to steer uh, companies, how to make sure that companies do change their course of action and take into consideration those issues related to biodiversity, human, human, uh, human uh, kind uh, behavior, uh, climate protection, etc. take more in, in, into uh, account and in include it in their corporate reporting activities. There is apparently from PwC a statement, uh, I couldn't verify whether it's really PwC or not, that says quite simply, sustainability is the profitability of tomorrow. Now, what that simply wants to express is that unless you really do uh, steer your company, or manage your company, uh, uh, along the lines of respecting sustain all, all aspects of sustainability, be it climate, be it man manpower, uh, be it the governance, etc., uh, you, you may lose your ability to be a productive company, to be a profitable company, and much faster than you expect, you might find yourself in serious trouble. This is what we, what we want to discuss here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, panel. And I have the great pleasure to introduce to you five uh, uh, distinguished panelists. And I've seated them, uh, ladies first, from you, <laughs> and the two gentlemen last, and, and then by alphabetical order. So <laughs> I, I hope that, 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 that no, <laughs> okay. So very much to, to, to my right, we have Anne Jorissen, she is professor at the University of Antwerp uh, here in Belgium, and uh, she is also the chair of the European uh, Accountants Association Financial Reporting Standards Committee. Uh, next to her sits uh, Nadia Picard, uh, although she has a French name, uh, uh, she is uh, by German by nationality, probably the Huguenots uh, came, came to the era where she is <laughs> has grown up. <laughs> she, she is a partner of of uh, PwC and in charge of global reporting, in other words, a global reporting leader. Verena Ross, to my right, already has been presented to you by Hans, uh, chair of, of ESMA. And next to me here to the left is Niklas Grip uh, from Handelsbanken in, in Stockholm, uh, a user, so to speak. He was the, uh, for six years, he has been the vice chair of the financial reporting tech group. And last not least, uh, we have Serge Patin, uh, who is a member of the EFRAC Financial Reporting Board, who has been, when, when the mandate of Jean-Paul Gazès came in end, he continued as acting uh, chair of the Financial Reporting Board, and he is now uh, continuing acting as a, a vice chair uh, of the FRB. So those are the five uh, highly distinguished individuals and I'm looking forward to a committed and engaged and, and uh, uh, discussion. Let me start with uh, the first uh, uh, question. Uh, where is financial reporting heading, particularly when considering the current economic environment in Europe? And I would like you to uh, answer briefly two minutes each. And I'll start with Nadia. With me, okay. Yes. Um, where's financial reporting heading? Um, we talked a lot already about consistency between the issues that a company faces and its financial reporting. So climate change will find its way into financial reporting regardless, and 
we will all have to focus and companies are focusing already now for this year end and going further as well, obviously for the next year ends on making sure that their assumptions and their estimates are consistent with what they say about their impact on climate change and especially vice versa, what climate change has an impact on the company. The same is very much true for inflation as you are addressing the current issues and supply chain um, problems that we are facing or that the companies are facing um, due to the war in Ukraine um, and other issues in China and so on. Let me explain what I mean by that real quick. Again, it's not that we need any new standards. We just need to go back a few years um, before we had all this stability and really reconsider estimates, assumptions that go into financial statements and revisit them and be a lot more diligent in making sure that we don't just continue the trends from the last years, but really make new assumptions on where the future will take us with respect to inflation, with respect to price increases. And that goes throughout the whole balance sheet, right? It starts with inventory, it goes up into useful lives of tangible, intangible assets. It goes down back on the other side around estimates around liabilities, uh, provisions and so on. So that's, I think, one of the most significant issues that I see for this year end in financial reporting. And if I turn to you, what, what, how does academia react to the current development? Also, do you see the need for two boards? Yes, um, so when in the academic world we saw the pro proposal coming of establishing two boards under the IFRS Foundation, we thought, well, is there really a need for both boards because both are for financial materiality, um, aren't the needs on sustainability, isn't it possible to cater for them within the general purpose financial statements? And so we're interesting to see where financial reporting will be going in the next couple of years, and more specifically, how the, well, the directions and the steps taken with respect to financial reporting by the EISB will be influenced to a certain extent by the evolutions in sustainability reporting. So up to now, financial reporting developed on its own based on demands of the stakeholders with respect to financial information that was useful for decision making. We would like to see, or we're interested to see, how this will evolve in the next couple of years. Uh, we already hear that, for example, the project on intangible assets, there will be close cooperation, uh, introduction of climate-related risk into the financial statements. So it will be interesting to see how financial reporting will evolve. Will they still be possible to take these independent steps that they've taken before, or will they be really close cooperation between the two boards? And maybe within five years we could say, well, maybe it's possible to merge the boards, or we are really then um, convinced that there is a necessity for the two boards. So that's a little bit from the academic, academic world. world. So now. I think I already spoke a bit about yes, that connectivity. Yes. Maybe I can take a slightly different tack here to just think back, if you think back the last three years, I mean, certainly every, all the parties in corporate reporting have been pretty much challenged by the generally fast-changing environment in which we've lived, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the invasion uh, of, by Russia of Ukraine. And so I think it's clear that there is a lot of challenges about how to bring these really speedy developments into an environment which provides the transparency about how the issuer is dealing with that and how they are changing their business model to be able to cope with the challenges that are there. So I think that macroeconomic environment is clearly posing, macroeconomic and geopolitical environment is clearly posing particular challenges. And so what we, for example, highlighted is how do you take properly into account things like the increase of interest rates on accounting for pension rights? How do you make sure that it properly feeds into the impairment of non-financial assets and so on? So there are certainly a lot of challenges ahead. And I think the current environment, not just because of the important issues of sustainability and how do we integrate that, but the more general environment is a very challenging one for corporate reporting at this point in time. Thanks a lot.
Uh, Nicholas. Uh, we have had a long period of rather dramatic changes in, in, in uh, standard setting. Uh, what is your feeling? Should we kind of slow down now, and particularly when it comes to financial reporting, uh, and, and leave it primarily to the sustainability development work? Or uh, do you see uh, particular areas where we still have to be committed and engaged? Yeah, focusing on, on financial reporting, I, I think it's really a, a need for, for a per period of calm because it has been some dramatic changes taking place. And during my 12 years in IFRAG, <laughs> it, all, all the big standards really have been created. Sounds like my, my back again. Uh, have been kind of created and decided and, and endorsed. And it's not just the financial reporting, also on the regulatory side being uh, employed by the financial community, there have been a lot of changes a as well. So, so it, it, it's a need for a period of calm and just maintenance work, I, I would say. But, but then on the maintenance work side, uh, it, it's a difficulty to be calm, I, th I think, sometimes. If you have a high ambitions as a standard setter, you want to go into the details and have the perfect recognition of a single transaction and, and so on. And, that risk creating big changes, even though that is not the intention. Uh, so, uh, and complementing that, what we have heard today, I think I'm the only preparer here that is speaking today, so a little bit from, from, from a preparer, it's the higher ambitions have a tendency to lead to quite detailed requirements. And thinking on connectivity, if the details doesn't match between different reporting requirements that create uh, very difficult situations for, for the preparers that have sometimes mutually exclusive requirements to, to adhere to. So, so trying to, to look up and more looking at the principles and giving headroom for presenting the true picture of, of your entity and not have that distorted by a lot of details would be a perfect development that I'm afraid of is not happening today. Thank you. Do you, do you join what uh, Nicholas just said, or what do you expect to be, should be tackled next? Well, let me first say there are three certainties in life. is death, <laughs> taxes, <laughs> and the fact that users are rarely happy with the financial information they get. <laughs> so from that perspective, I think financial reporting remains work in progress. Not only because the users are so demanding, but there are always new things happening. Many years ago, we had a financial crisis. Then we discovered that interest rates could become negative, and now we're facing inflation and, and an energy crisis. So automatically, you ask yourself the question, what does that do to uh, the usefulness of financial reporting? It's difficult for me to pinpoint a list of projects that need to be tackled immediately. Um, I have two favorites, Andreas. Uh, operating segments and uh, cash flow statement. I learned that I can forget about operating segments, but I'm pretty happy that you're picking up the same of cash flows. So my success rate is 50%, which is not bad. Um, dynamic risk management, primary financial statements should be finished, let's say, as soon as possible. Um, we're quite happy with primary financial statements. We had a user panel yesterday. I must say, um, we're not happy with all the dec tentative decisions taken so far, but okay. Let's finish this one because it is, as a project, a very a major step in the, uh, in, 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 in the right direction. Uh, I'm personally I'm a big fan of the post representation rules. I was happy to, well, I knew, but I'm, I was happy to, to hear that uh, 9 is on the way, 15 is starting, and 16 is coming. Because the post representation review is a tremendously e interesting exercise. You're asking stakeholders, does that standard work or not, and how and why? So, if there are users uh, at home or in the, in the room, please stand up, and if there's something wrong with those standards, let us know. Uh, in this way, you can uh, weigh on, 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 on how accounting standards look like. But this debate is about connectivity, and, and uh, by accident, I, I've also written our management commentary. Because almost automatically, when s the current proposal touches upon sustainability issues, but as sustainability reporting is building up, <coughs> I think the IRSB will have, uh, perhaps as a first initiative, take a look at management commentary and see how do the financial and the sustainability reporting uh, uh, interact. Uh, so the uh, focus today is absolutely on, on, on sustainability reporting, but it doesn't mean that financial 
reporting is dead, it's alive and kicking and, and keeps evolving. Thank you. And uh, I turn now to Anne again uh, and, and ask you, what, what, this morning we heard Emmanuel Faber uh, uh, say that uh, he would also be work, or he is working or will, will start working pretty soon on developing a conceptual framework which uh, in, in the financial reporting uh, pretty much exists, but in, in the uh, sustainability area is in the making, making process. So uh, what are the different requirements? Would they be compatible, and, and how do you see them being connected? Yeah, so if we talk about connected, interconnected, comparable, there are a lot of words used uh, to maybe pinpoint at the same big direction that sustainability reporting information and financial information should at least be coherent and that companies shouldn't provide mixed messages uh, to users. Um, if we look at the interconnection or can information really be, be interconnected, financial information, sustainability information, then it would be ideal that both follow a similar conceptual framework I know in the uh, first uh, European sustainability reporting standards, you have these qualities of accounting information included. But another important element, I guess, for information to have the possibility to be interconnected is that it serves more or less the same purpose. And if I look then, but then I look specifically at the European sustainability reporting uh, information, the purpose is in fact twofold. Uh, it is providing users with relevant general purpose financial information to make decisions. But at the same time, there was the idea, I guess, about of the European Parliament to make sure that companies reported in a transparent way about their sustainable actions and their actions that have impacts on climate and, and humans. And by those re asking those reporting requirements, they hope to influence the behavior of companies immediately or at least in the very short term. And therefore, we have uh, uh, items like double materiality, reporting along the value chain that are not present in financial reporting. And so I think if we look for interconnectivity, we have to look for interconnectivity of information that is able to be interconnected. And then I think the sustainability information that is also taking a, ma a financial materiality approach that has the same scope, so not the uh, outside-in approach, that that information is able to be interconnected. So I think with respect to interconnection, one shouldn't be too ambitious, but only try to, for the moment, try to interconnect that information that is possible to interconnect because it serves the same purpose. Serge, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the question is to what extent should information provided within one framework uh, be connected with the information in the other framework? I have this feeling we shouldn't even ask the question. There's no alternative. I mean, because if you think about it, if you read sustainability information as a user, then automatically you ask yourself the question what this does to the financials? And if you read the financials, automatically you ask the question to what extent has the su sustainability strategy or platform impacted those financials. So there has to be a link. They have to be interconnected. And especially now in this let's start up phase, so to speak, you can easily find examples whereby technology gets outdated over a number of years for sustainability reasons. <coughs> Products might have to disappear in, in, a, few, in a few years. Mm -hmm. Markets, certain markets might cease to exist. All that information is hopefully captured by sustainability reporting, but automatically you ask yourself the question, what, it is that, what does it do to the outlook, uh, to the financials today and in the future? Uh, supply chains are, 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 are revised, so what will that do to the, uh, to the financials over time? So as soon as you start analyzing uh, companies, you automatically connect the two the two approaches. So, uh, uh, as I said, you, we shouldn't even ask the question. Uh, there's no alternative. And also, when I think about sustainability, 
I, I, I like the aspect of risk management. So f to a large extent, I think sustainability <laughs> has also to do with how do I manage my sustainability risks. Of course, sustainability risks are not assets, they are sometimes liabilities, they are not visible, so to speak, in the financial statements. They are quite important because it, 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 gives, it, it signals you what the entity has to take into account to assure the future. And it gives you an idea about the future free cash flow and the future profitability that, 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 that can be realized by the entity. Um, and when I say risk management, I always add it's also opportunities management. Eh? Because if you discover your risk, you also discover the opportunities. So there too, if you're managing your sustainability risk, automatically you will link it to what does it mean for the financials going forward. So yes, the two need to be connected, absolutely. I mean, Marina, you talked about this question also in your introductory statement. Uh, EFRAC's new logo is Europe's voice on corporate reporting. In other words, <coughs> we already assume that there will be a corporate reporting rather than a financial reporting <coughs> and a sustainable being in completely independent. So the two have to, sooner or later, have to be the merged into one, also from a potential investor's point of view or user's point of view. Uh, would you want to extend on, on that one or? No, I would just reiterate yeah. that um, uh, to me, it is very hard, as, as others here have said, to put the two things completely apart because yeah. uh, sustainability reporting and the risks that are coming from sustainability issues will directly reflect on the financials yeah. and the other way around because it is business decisions which will also impact. So for me, the two are very, very closely interlinked. I think at the time, for the time being, what is most important is that there is proper cross-reference and proper connectivity between the two reports. Will that ultimately mean we end up with one report? I don't know, but I certainly think the, um, the connectivity and connectedness needs to be there. But can I chime yeah. in? Th there's still a little bit of work to do, right? So th let me give you a few examples. Um, segment information, you mentioned mm -hmm. it, right? Um, often is looked at through a product lens or a services lens, a group of services, group of products for companies. If you then switch back to sustainability reporting, sustainability issues are much more frequently managed on a geographical basis mm -hmm. because it makes more sense. How does then the risk management on sustainability issues really talk to the segment view in the financial statements if you start lifting it up into that one coherent story around a broader concept of performance of a company? I'll give you another example. If you purchase offsets, carbon offsets, is the period that this appears in the sustainability report as a deduction from the CO2 balance, the same as the amortization period in the financial statements or not? And, and do we need to think this through? I, I don't have the answer. I just have questions that we are debating with clients, right? Discontinued operations and taxonomy information, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the P&L all of a sudden doesn't show the revenues anymore that the company controls, yet the taxonomy information still goes to this complete number of revenues. So there are a number of connections that mm -hmm. still need to be made and mm -hmm. that we need to sift through in detail and unearth and then discuss and then see, do we need, there's one question in here, do we need changes to the financial statements mm -hmm. or the financial standards or do we need a bit more clarification and that goes back to the point that was discussed this morning the maintenance that AFRAG and other sustainability standard setters might need to do on their um, standards to really make sure that they really talk to each other. So, so yeah, th this is basically what you're saying. Basically, in line was has been uh, at uh, already in, in the other uh, panels, namely that you know we we are in, in work in progress. We, we are working on it. We, we don't have the, the final product yet and the final answer. Fair enough. So uh, EFRAC, of course, uh, in its uh, 20, 21 years, has been working closely with regulators and ISB and users and, and, and others and stakeholders of companies. Uh, what will, <coughs> will that have to change, get more intense, more regular, or how do you see that, Nicholas? Uh, 
Uh, my view being in some way involved in looking into new regulations, not just financial reporting, but, but catalytic and so on since 1998, uh, I would conclude that there has always been a need for, for different regulators of different kinds to work together because the too often we have seen that, that they, they are crashing into each other and are kind of mutually exclusive or kind of quotation mark, uh, de destroy one business uh, and, and so on. And, one example is that more measurement at fair value have taken away risk takers from the market and that have created less global liquid markets and so on. So it have implications when you change the money area, it have implications on the other areas as well. Uh, one particular thing that really created need nowadays, I think, to, to work even closer together, that is that we, we kind of have being a regulated entity, again, three reports. We report to the regulatory authorities of different kinds. We, we report to, to financial statement information and we will report sustainability information. And uh, it, it's not helped when, when those that come up with the different rules and the perfect definitions have different definitions. Mm -hmm. Just an example, when, when we, I was responsible for creating our res reporting to the resolution authority. When we looked into the definition of SME, we already have five definitions, but we, we hadn't a definition needed for resolution reporting. So I, I'm not sure that SEPs and other users, that when I look at our different reports, understand that even though it's the same word, it's totally different meaning. So, so it's a need to work together to, when possible, have common definitions and so on, and not be too detailed. Another area is governance, for instance, important thing in sustainability, some of the requirements there is in conflict with, with EBA guidance, for instance, for regulatory purposes mm -hmm. and so on. So, so being so explicit and detailed creates problems mm -hmm. for the preparer. So, so try to, as I said on the first question, try to lift the, the requirements a little bit to, to be more principle-based, and then it will be possible to align the different requirements with each other in reporting, and that will help all the users of, of the different reports, I would say. Over the years, EFRAC and, uh, uh, has developed <coughs> a way of, of working together with the IASB, uh, with regulators. They had regular discussions and consultations, etc. Now, can you simply uh, take that approach and say, well, now there will be one actor in addition, namely the ISSB at the uh, EFRAC uh, uh, Sustainability uh, Reporting Board? Or will this additional uh, structure that we have now at international level and at EFRAC level, will that possibly change the way that these actors work together? Lorena? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think what is already great in a way, and it helps the connectivity, that you have actually the ISSB and the IFRS here in AFRAC, the sustainability and the financial reporting under one roof and talking mm, to yeah. each other. I think that's already a good starting yeah. point because at least you are looking at it with the same people, with the same intention, with the same vision and the same objectives. So I think that's already very important. I think the other thing that certainly uh, we have very positively seen is the great cooperation over the last months between AFRAC and the IFSB in particular to try to also see how can we align between what we are doing in Europe, which obviously we started a bit earlier with a big ambition, and what is happening at the international uh, side, which you know has to meet after all requirements that fit the whole of the global financial markets, not just the European ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that cooperation we've seen has really uh, led to a lot closer alignment now in the continued work on finalizing the standards. And I think that is really important. And then maybe just finally, I would say, I know you know you were talking about other regulators and I very much uh, see you were also looking at me. And uh, certainly that is something which we are very conscious of and we also obviously have a role to play when it comes to trying to make sure that on the sustainability reporting side, there's also alignment with what is happening on other um, sustainability legislation, be it benchmarks, be it SFDR reporting and things like that. But it is difficult because we have different legal acts which all, don't always talk ideally to each other, mm -hmm. but we will certainly do our best. And I think the best way forward for me is that we also try to continue to do joint projects 
jointly talking about what is our forward-looking work plan. Can we make sure that we don't just duplicate, but that we try to do things together and in a reasonably aligned timing uh, so that we can also make sure we, we do things in a coordinated way? I'm from an academic point of view. Do you uh, have any uh, demands on the way that these various institutions and actors work together? Do you feel from from your from past experience uh, that there are improvement necessary improvement, uh, or, or or are you quite happy the way it has worked so far? And you say, okay, we'll we'll come be more complicated because there's now one or two. Uh, institutions more involved, but basically it, they are do it, They know how to work together. And they, they exchange the information quite well. If I look at academic research, then what we always look at is the quality of the information that is um, published to the markets. And what we see is that the quality of the supervisor or the quality of enforcement is quite important and I think when ESMA really brought together all the national stock market supervisors I should say I think in Europe and academic evidence is available that the accounting quality of the financial statements improved in fact compared to the initial uh, evidence we have in 2005 when IFRS became mandatory um, are we really worried on the academic side that there is another body coming up and that, yeah, I don't, we will look in fact like how strong are market super, uh, supervisors, how strong will enforcement be in the different countries in order to guarantee high quality information. I mean, in when it comes to financial reporting, we have seen in the past Unfortunately, I should say, again and again, a criminal energy being applied and uh, uh, crimes, you might say, huge damage to investors, users, em employees, uh, despite the fact that we have had clear, clear standards, despite the fact that we've had supervisors, despite the, that we've had professional auditors. So, uh, and, and I'm not talking about the Enrons, et cetera, of, of, of this world that was more than 10 years ago. I mean, Wirecard has just happened two years ago in Germany. And it's a huge scandal, really, in, involving billions of, 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 of euros. Now, um, how can we make sure that when it comes to sustainability, we are not also falling victim to wrong uh, reporting, greenwashing, uh, eliminating elim eliminating the the black sheep of the value chain, etc. You know, how can we show that 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 this is not happening? Anybody volunteering? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we just completed an investor survey, um, and indeed, eighty-seven percent of investors, and that was global. That's not European. That was. Yeah is a global number, 87% of investors think that corporate reporting has some sort of greenwashing in it. 87% mm -hmm. of investors. Um, what are they asking for? They're asking for proper standards that are properly implemented, mm -hmm. that are clear, and that is the journey that we're on, right? I mean, we, we have the ESRSs sitting there, um, almost ready for application. Um, the ISSB will issue their standards. They're good standards. They will provide this clarity and they will drive out what the issues are and what they are not. We have a system upcoming of assurance being provided for the, over these reportings. And we will have regulators breathing down the neck of both auditors and preparers. So the system that is being applied to sustainability reporting is the same system that is being applied to financial reporting. Now, will that find the crooks? Um, it will find the crooks just as it finds the crooks with financial reporting. And criminal energy is something that, I don't know that we want to be discussing that now. Let, let's take it to the positive side and really think a bit more around 
capacity building to actually apply the standards, which is sometimes a bit underplayed in these discussions. I hope we get to that in a second, um, because it's not done by having the standards. They need to be applied, and mm -hmm. companies are really, really struggling with that, yeah? because the systems, processes, understandings, controls, the help of software and technology to do proper reporting and producing investment grade data is not built out as it is for financial reporting. Right? Mm -hmm. For financial reporting, somebody takes a can of oil, puts them into a machine, and poof, the re effect sits somewhere in a set of financial <laughs> statements. Right? That's what the ERP systems <laughs> almost do to integrate financial reporting where it's all really well understood. Yeah? We don't have the software solutions yet for proper data capture, and the proper software solutions for data management are in production, right? It's a long way to go mm -hmm. to really get to a, let's push a button and get a proper sustainability report out that we then review and, and ponder over and, and bring together with financial reporting. It, it will take a little while and it will be a significant effort where mistakes will be made initially. If I just think about the amount of spreadsheets flying around with sustainability information, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you? So, yeah, um, just a few seconds. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add to that. If you say, will we catch the persons that are doing greenwashing? Well, we have the standards in place, but that's just one item. We need proper assurance, but we mm -hmm. also need the enforcers, mm -hmm. and there needs to be a risk of litigation. So yeah. what we see with financial reporting that when the risk of litigation is high, companies will comply with the accounting standards. If you um, issue IFRSs in a country with ro low risk of litigation, they don't comply with the standards, despite the fact that they say these accounts are prepared according to IFRS. So I will think it will take some years because not only um, auditors and independent assurance have to learn the standards, but also the courts in the different countries because they are responsible for the litigation. Mm -hmm. Verena? Yeah, I very much agree with what uh, my co-panelists have said. So I think it's the standards is obviously the first important step because one of the big problems we mm -hmm. have at the moment is that I, a lot of companies report some Something. bits in their financial <laughs> statement. Others, they report to uh, credit ratings. Others, they report to some other data providers. Mm -hmm. And that is a confusing set of things. And everything is based on different definitions, different uh, reporting forms, and so on. It's a huge burden, and it's confusing. And I think so the standards are an important first step. But that's not the end of it. We need the right ecosystem around that. We need everyone to learn the new standards and actually be able to apply them. I'm sure when we start applying them, whether it's companies or whether it's supervisor and regulators, we will find that not everything is as clear as we thought it was when we actually designed the standards. So there is ongoing work that we need to do. And this learning curve is something that we are very conscious of. And I think we are also conscious it's a learning curve on the supervisory side mm -hmm. and enforcer side, but it's also a learning curve for the preparers and uh, the users. So, and in that environment, there's clearly a risk of greenwashing. But at the same time, we first need to get the transparency right, and then we need to make mm -hmm. sure that we go and actually focus on properly enforcing and applying it. And in the meantime, there is this huge demand for green products. So of course, there's a huge supply where everyone says, I'm green. But what I would just say is everyone needs to make sure that what they say actually is backed up for what is in whatever they are doing. And that is something that is is a principle which you know we don't need standards for. The standards would just help us to make it clearer. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce another question here, namely, uh, is your uh, feeling and the feedback that you get from, from companies that there is understanding of the need of, of what is being uh, done right now? Or do they say, well, yet and then an, an extra bird coming from Brussels and more time needed to, to, uh, to do it and more money spent, etc.? cetera? Or is, do, they, do they, in fact, even, even are afraid of, of uh, having a, a competitive disadvantage uh, in going that way, or do, could, can we convince them that at the end of the day it will even be a competitive 
advantage, not a disadvantage, but an advantage, because Europe, again, like in so many other fields, is taking the lead that will eventually become the uh, uh, accepted, uh, even in other jurisdictions, and, and those companies that have been used to that uh, do have an advantage then. Nadia? Yes. Yes, the answer um, is yes. So <laughs> <laughs> <I could. laughs> Look, um, companies complain because they yes. are heavily burdened right now. Right, right now, this moment, there's heavy burdens on companies with a variety of issues they need to grapple with. Companies in Europe are behind the quest. I mean, what we're doing here is a reflection of a societal demand of which companies are a part to get on with the issue. So they're behind the quest. They're really starting to prepare, looking at processes, systems, people, training, changing their operating models, right? Mm -hmm. Because the whole reporting cycle cannot be done with sustainability people only. It cannot be done with financial reporting people only. It needs to bring these people together which sometimes in companies creates tension. It's a transformation process, a change process that needs to be managed well. And that starts actually at the board level where the board members, the C-suite, needs to decide on how they want to address the issue and then run it throughout the company. Again, processes, systems, controls, everything. And that is happening right now, right? We're having these discussions. We're seeing these programs. But let me also give you a number of a company outside Europe that starts to, an American company that we talk to, they start to understand what CSRD means for them eventually. And they get really scared because they're not as prepared as the typical European company. Um, that particular company has estimated that uh, ultimate compliance by 2028 will cost them something like 60 to 70 million just in running it through the company and actually doing it. I was not surprised at that number. Um, and, and that is something that we will still see. Now, what I really like about it is companies are really waking up outside Europe and are appreciating the quest that Europe is on in bringing a sustainable business performance thought into the world. Yeah? And, and it's big words, but they're really starting to understand it. And that addresses your question around competitive advantage or disadvantage. If we don't do it, we will not have business. So it's not a question of um, can we avoid it to be more competitive? And it will sort itself over time because companies, by and large, on a global scale, particularly for the listed ones where we have regulators through IOSCO and then the security regulators in the various countries, also mandating that reporting that will bring the reporting on par and there will be not a competitive disadvantage. Again, yes to the last question as well, turning it around into a possible advantage because Europe starts with it earlier. Okay. That was a big response, sorry for that. Yeah, no, I, I, I would uh, just very briefly say that I think um, I listened to a panel actually yesterday at a conference of CEOs and CFOs of European companies, mm -hmm. and you had exactly that debate. Some were saying, actually, it's a huge burden now, it's very difficult, it's costing me a lot, and so on. And on the other hand, the other half was saying, with their other part of their heart, were saying, actually, but it is an opportunity. We need to do it. And actually, by being ahead in Europe, we are creating also a competitive advantage for the future. Okay. But I think the view is quite split, is my impression. All right. I well, have a demand to, to, to Sven, actually. Fun? To Sven? I, yeah. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go on, ahead. On, Sven, on, do you listen? Back, back, <laughs> back to the question of um, do people talk to each other, to regulators and, and standard setting bodies all talk to each other? I talked to a Nigerian colleague yesterday and they are um, they're one of the countries that pledged to implement ISSB standards as soon as they are available and the whole country and government and securities exchange they don't know how to deal with it they don't have the processes and and the the, the yeah the ability to even 
have regulation and audit regulation and, and enforcement and information capture in their systems. So they're really struggling and they're looking for help. And I think that uh, would be a good role for the EU also to have to help other countries to get on with it. So. Okay. Now it's, it's obvious that, that the volume of, of requirements uh, on sustainability, on financial reporting, regulation, etc., is, is growing. What does that, <coughs> what impact does that have on digital consumption and on processes? within the companies. And All right. Um, and you too. Then. So we think that digital consumption of the sustainability information, financial information, will definitely help to uh, overcome the information overload. Because in the beginning, users will face a lot of information. Uh, they might not, uh, it might be costly for them to access them. So digitalization could be a solution. So this means that digital consumption of financial information relies on taxonomies. And in order to be successful, we need performant taxonomies. And if we look at the performance of taxonomies in the past and so far, then we see that tagging the information often also leads to mistakes or to omitted information. So if we could take the opportunity to make taxonomies at the moment also more performant, then, or, uh, then I think it could be a huge advantage. One element that we are in the academic world a little bit, um, well, hesitant about is the fact, will digital consumption of financial and sustainability information influence the way it is used? Is taxonomies and digitalization, does it go along or is it a challenge for principles-based uh, accounting? Will taxonomy not lead to more rules-based accounting? And if we look at the use at the moment of accounting information and maybe also sustainability information, um, it's always contextual and we can only grasp what is communicated through the financial numbers if we know the context. And that might be a challenge that when we all move to digital consumption of financial and sustainability information that we lose the context and we lose a little bit the richness that is included in the data. So that is something we would like to watch in the future to see how the usage of information is influenced by yeah, the digital uh, offering of that information. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting point. I think um, I was going to come at the topic from the fact that these are huge data amounts and more and more is clearly um, done through digital means of actually trying to analyze that data. I don't know, from the user perspective, it's clear that you, know, you don't look at paper formats of this uh, information anymore. So I think from that perspective, clearly we need to progress with the um, digital consumption of that data and the European single electronic format for financial reporting has introduced that. I think we now need to make sure we move that across into the sustainability reporting and that's clearly on the agenda. So we look forward to working with EFRAC on that and uh, also uh, like we work with the ISB on the IFRS uh, tagging and so on. So that will be, uh, will be coming. I think it's important. I can see the point of you need to make sure that you still get the context in which some of that information is there. But I think to allow comparability across a large net set of different uh, companies, this digital format will be absolutely key uh, to make sure that we get actually get the comparability and the comprehensibility of the information and can use it. I think the other thing I would say is it also helps with the greater bringing together of different pieces of information. So if we look at the European single access point, this idea, this big idea under the capital markets union that you would bring information together on companies from all different parts of the financial regulation and financial reporting world, that is clearly a possibility that you can only do when you have digitalized data. So from that perspective, I think it's very important that we do work on this together. All right. Do, do you uh, uh, 
already see in, 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 in your clients' organizations uh, work, that they are working on changing the processes, etc. Yeah. yeah, massively. Um, massively. The, whenever I get a call around, can you help me with taxonomy, can you help me with CSRD, um, the second question is, how should I govern these data? these processes, mm -hmm. which is not a question um, in, in, in this group here. Let me clarify, it's a question about target operating model and, and responsibilities throughout the company, who does what, who's supervising what, who needs to collaborate with whom, which is all new processes in companies. And yes, they're very much working on this. They're also very much working with, well, they're pushing the software providers to provide them with better and more solutions um, because they need that. It, it, it can't be done manually um, because of the reporting cycles, right? You, we can't wait for six months for financial information to be published because they are waiting for the sustainability reporting to finally make it manually through the company. So um, companies are very, very much working on this and very alert to the fact that they have to start now. Mm -hmm. Serge. Yes. May I turn turn to you? Um, <clears throat> when we look at the, at the user uh, of you know financial reports, um, when you put yourself into his shoes, what what would you say does he expect really, and uh, to what extent would he, following our discussions, be very optimistic, and where would he have a question mark? I think that. Um Financial reporting, as important as it is, is, is evolving towards a kind of integrated corporate reporting framework. Mm -hmm. I'll explain myself. Um, many people that look at me as a user think I'm a number cruncher, uh, building Excel models for the sake of um, building Excel models. Uh, <laughs> but that is not the case. In fact, as an analyst, you're not analyzing numbers. You're analyzing companies. And um, oh. the numbers are the words that you use to, to tell your story. Mm. And that's not, I, that, it's something I learned from Professor Damodaran in one of his YouTube films. He said, when you value a company, you're not valuing, you're telling a story. And that is absolutely true. Now, if you think about how companies communicate with societies, we need to broaden our perspective. And, and for me, that financial reporting evolves towards corporate reporting. There's a very interesting, on the IFRS website, there's a very, uh, on the, the project page on, on, the project page on uh, management commentary, they try to explain what management commentary is, so they have, they combine financial reporting with sustainability reporting, and then the third angle is others. Now for an analyst, there's nothing as important as others. <laughs> and if you think about it, I think these others are will become very important. And it's three things just straight from the heart I'd like to mention is strategy. I think in the corporate reporting, there's not enough information about strategy. And we, we the budget analysts, analyze each year about 50 annual reports. And mm -hmm. we're also disappointed that we hardly find any information about where do we want to go. Mm -hmm. Now you might say strategy is difficult, dangerous. Yes, I agree. But very often the entities have a strategic committee, but the only thing you know is how many times they've met during the year and who was part of the committee. <laughs> but I don't always think they must have taken certain decisions or not. So <laughs> strategy is one of the others. Yeah. The <coughs> another other is business model, wh which I always define as right. what do you do, for who do, you do, for who do you do it, uh, where do you do it, how do you do it? Eh? Mm -hmm. Try to explain mm -hmm. your business model, that might become quite important given the discussions you have on sustainability and again risk management because mm -hmm. how is the company managing its risks and I add to that and its opportunities gives me insights in, 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 in uh, what gives me insights in, in how the company is looking at the future and helps me to calculate whatever free cash flow mm -hmm. return invested capital going forward so I think we're, we're moving towards a kind of more integrated corporate reporting platform 
financial reporting will remain a very important aspect of, of, of mm. because the proof of the pudding is in the eating, of course, yeah. I agree. But uh, And I like what Ann said, you're always analyzing the numbers in a context against a certain background. And the others and the sustainability reporting is the background. Well, I think we have to come to a, to a close of, of this uh, panel discussion, but I would like each panelist to take one minute and give a kind of final, uh, final statement or final conclusion, whatever you want, a final message to the audience. And you go ahead. All right. Um, so I've been around in <laughs> financial reporting already for quite some time, but I think at the moment we have very challenging times, exciting times, because up until now, we've looked at financial reporting or at corporate reporting uh, for decision-making purposes to inform investors, creditors better, better. Now we can develop sustainability reporting information and we don't only provide better information for decision-making, but hopefully, if we are able to influence behavior of companies, we are moving also to a better, more sustainable world. And I think this is very challenging. A and exciting. Nadia? Passions, passions and patience, I think, is what I would like to introduce mm -hmm. here. Passions to really, passion to really get it done, to, to move to a world of better corporate reporting mm -hmm. for investors and other stakeholders, underpinned by excellent processes and systems, but also patience in the journey to getting that done, because we're really just at the beginning. Um, uh, exciting and passion and I think for all of us a big and steep learning curve where we really need to build capacity and need to work together to try to uh, find the right way forward and that I think need, leads to learning to interconnect the different parts of the puzzle and also finding global solutions wherever we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my main, main message was really that regardless of, of uh, if you're going forward, focus on develop different kinds of standards separately or not, it's a need that you communicate together and if possible have common definitions. Uh, uh, another thing I tried to express was that avoid too specific details. They risk inter making mm -hmm. different kinds of standards interfering with each other even though you want to be amb ambitious and precise and uh, avoid greenwashing and whatever, you, you, you need to do that by having principles that, that are co cohesive between the different standards. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so please make sure that you're not too ambitious with the details going forward. Thank you. Serge? Financial reporting, corporate reporting uh, are evolving rapidly. Um, this morning was said we should ask ourselves the question, why do we do this? So it, we all agree it's very important. And for you, it's exciting times because the, um, there's more to analyze. Corporate reporting is evolving. There will be more, inf more information available. So uh, it will take some time. We're on a, in a, on a learning curve. But I'm absolutely confident that the final result will be positive. OK. So let me say uh, at the very end, uh, also, I'm looking at the future rather optimistically. I think the. Uh, Warning of the, has been has been heard, and and we are reacting late, but not too late. And I hope that with enthusiasm and commitment that I feel everywhere here, uh, we will be able to sort of turn the corner, and uh, 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 be once again maybe leader in 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 a in a field that is 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 important for the future of of, of all of us of the citizens of the companies and maybe we can lead the way and make sure that other jurisdictions out there, the EU, will follow our example. Thank you. You're all still awake? Everybody's still in good shape? It's a long day, it's true. So, I uh, will close the session and starting specifically by thanking all the speakers and all the panel members. I know how this is prepared at EFRAC and believe me there's a lot of preparation that went through this. 
I would also like to thank specifically the EFRAC staff, not only for the organization today, but also for the continuous work that those people are doing, have been doing, and will be doing for the coming years. I hope so. Uh, which is an enormous effort. Now, really, I, I mean this really, really, really very much. Thank you to all the stakeholders supporting us, being present, really helping us through it. And thanking also to the technical and organizational people, because if you don't make it work, it won't work. So we agree. Um, if I have a very, very, very short wrap up of what we heard today, and I'm going to miss half of it, so no worries, but I'm going to keep it short. EFRAC delivers clearly high quality standards on time. It's something that we've been hearing a number of times. We do focus on reporting, but we should also focus on more, but our main task is reporting. This is a must because we want to improve our planet and part of, let's say, that is part of a larger movement. We are not alone, certainly this morning and also this afternoon, we are not alone, but must work together with, on the one hand side, sustainability parties, GRI, ISB, Wiki, and other parties, but of course, as well on financial reporting, work further together as we did with the IESB and with different parties there as well. We need to think, and that's very important, I think, double materiality and interoperability are a number of words that are really of the utmost importance. Ladies and gentlemen, here it comes. We need more funding uh, <laughs> <laughs> to bring, implement our goals, and we need more people and resources, and the one funding and resources are inter... The interoperability between the two is very clear. Thank you very much. So. We are, and it is true, it was also put forward by the Commissioner, we are living in a time-changing period, and also Wolf repeated it again. A lot of things are changing, and it's difficult to follow up. Uh, we live in times of energy crisis, war, recessions, climate-threatening issues, our uh, have you. Again, not only sustainability reporting evolves, but also financial reporting evolves, and they are very, very much interlinked. We will need to look at the full picture. So ESMA will follow up on the steep learning curve that is uh, necessary here. Issuers need to go through, build effective mechanism against greenwashing. We'll need, need to have those follows up. Risks must be better disclosed, was also back in the last panel, and their disclosures enforced. Digitizations, those who know me, I think this is one of the key elements that we really need to put forward, both on financial and sustainability reporting, and I agree with Sergey, you cannot take them separately as well. They go together. EFRAC, as a final conclusion, has grown very clearly to maturity, being a professional advisor to the European Commission. But again, and I mean this from the bottom of my, of my heart, also a family. If you see how we operate, how we work together, uh, it is an important evolution. And to conclude with wise words spoken by Sven, look what sustain sustainability has been doing to us. Look what sustainability is doing to us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. There is a closing drink, so don't run. And it's at the same place as we were before. And I do thank you very, very much.